Hello and welcome back. Uh, so this is our last session of the day for today. Uh, we were going to talk about uh, intensive care. So we will have two prominent speakers. The first one, uh, I think you already know her, uh, Dr. Dita from Indonesia. And she will talk about stem cell therapy in COVID ARDS. And the second speaker is Prof. Kan Injem from Netherlands. And he will discuss about artificial intelligence and the microcirculation. And this session will be uh, moderated by Dr. Martin Westphal from Germany. Please, Martin. Yeah, hello, everybody, and warm welcome to this very exciting session. And I'm very happy to be the moderator of this last session of the day. And I can tell you, I'm very much honored um, to be together again with this nice community. I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Susilo, and the whole great team very much to make this possible. And we have seen that you are able to get the world connected. So congratulations to this. This is really amazing and outstanding. And I'm also very happy and proud that we have the opportunity to discuss two very exciting topics. And as you have already mentioned, Krisa, our first speaker will be Dr. Dita, whom I also know already for many years. And I would like at least to briefly introduce her, although most of you already know her. So Dr. Dita is from Jakarta. She's a medical doctor and PhD. She is a specialist in anesthesiology and critical care. And since 2018, she's the head of the intensive care and burn unit at Siptu Mangun Kusumo Hospital in Jakarta and has held many leading positions. And in addition to all her clinical activities that she is performing, she's also doing a lot of interesting and exciting research. And as such, she has published around 20 publications. And I at least would like to highlight two, namely a recent one that was including a prevalence and outcome study that was published in the JAMA together with well-known um, experts and key opinion leaders in the field. And what I also was very much fascinated is about a, a recent article, a very recent article, where you were looking into an innovative treatment option uh, to help the cure of critically ill COVID-19 patients. And this is also something that you are going to address today. And I'm very, very much looking forward to the topic, which is cell, uh, stem cell therapy, which is something really new, exciting, but this might be a very good and new opportunity. So Dita, please um, go ahead. The stage is yours and we are happy to have you with us. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Krisha and Professor Martin Westphal for a very nice introduction. Hopefully all of you can hear my voice. So yes. I would like to share um, my slide. So hopefully everybody can see the slide clearly. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like also to thank you, uh, the Indo-Anesthesia Committee for inviting me to present uh, the stem cell therapy for COVID RDS. As an introduction, this is a brief history of the stem cell from 1908 until 1961, was the year of the first existence and properties of the stem cells were discovered. And up until 2018, stem cells have made incredible interest for repairing damaged tissue and organs, which is appeared to be a reasonable therapeutic strategy. And it seems to represent a future powerful uh, therapy in regenerative medicines and in the future. So how about uh, itself for the RDS and COVID RDS up until 2020? Um, so applications of MSN chemical stem cells for pulmonary diseases. Uh, there are 81 ongoing and completed clinical trial investigated for the MSEs, the stem cells treatment for pulmonary diseases and 60 trials out of it is for uh, the COVID-19 patients. So how is the stem cell uh, working? Uh, cell transplantation actually is an umbrella term for stem cell transplantation is the process of transferring cells into the area of the body that are damaged or injured. And the cells can be transplanted 
uh, straight into the injury site for direct repair. But also the cells can be transplanted into the blood when they are, can circulate around the body and cause system-wide uh, changes. Um, so this is uh, the type of uh, the stem cells. Uh, the stem cells uh, can be classified according to their origin and can be classified according to their differential potential. According to their origin, uh, it divides into four broad types from embryos, from the fetus, from the infants, and from the adults. And according uh, to the differential potential, stem cells can be classified as a totipotent, pluripotent, multipotent, unipotent, and oligopotent. It's kind of difficult to say. Especially for the pluripotent stem cell, it has the ability of the cells to produce any type of cells in the organism and are capable of differentiating into cells representative of a variety of adult tissue types in a various assay, including cardiomyocyte, neural progenital cells, hematopoietic progenital cells, and some growth factor properties. And for multipotent stem cells means to those cells that can only give rise to cells of the tissue from which they are isolated. So why the umbilical cord uh, mesenchymal cells versus bone marrows or adipose tissue mesenchymal cells? The umbilical cord uh, stem cells represent an attractive source of mesenchymal stem cells, as from umbilical cord are less ethical concern compared to like embryonic stem cell. And the isolation of its stem cell is non-invasive as compared if we collect it from bone marrow. Umbilical cord uh, mesenchymal stem cells is also have been shown to have a similar efficacy in modulating the inflammations as the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. The umbilical cord mesenchymal cells also showed a greater proliferation, slower aging stem cell rate, a greater anti-inflammatory effect as compared to bone marrow or adipose tissue mesenchymal stem cells. So it's suggesting that uh, umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cell might be a better alternative for stem cell-based uh, therapy. So it is preferable to store both uh, cord blood and umbilical cord tissue to facilitate the maximum recovery of all stem cell cell types. So the umbilical cord can be used for isolating the epithelial, hematopoietic, and mesenchymal cells. In core blood vessels, the intravascular and perivascular zone, subamniotic zone, and amniotic epithelium, those are available sources for the stem cell. Even the umbilical cord blood itself contains hematologic stem cells that can be utilized for generations of various of blood cells. The mesenchymal stem cells were successfully isolated from Wharton jelly, amniotic fluid, and membrane and cord lining where the epithelial cell cell were isolated from the internal and external layers of the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord blood contains Wharton jelly, which is the matrix, uh, is considered to be a source of the mesenchymal stem cells. And these cell express a typical stem cell markers populations with the potential to differentiate into various somatic cells, such as myocardiac cell, neuron cell, wound epithelium cells, hematologic uh, cell diseases, uh, cure diabetes, even for the autism behavioral disorders. They are an adherent cells with a fibroblast-like appearance that can produce immunomodulatory effect, anti-inflammatory effect. It can differentiate into type one, type two alveolar epithelial cells and has anti-fibrosis effect of the lung. So the mechanism of the mesenchymal stem cells can improve lung injury. So it's, secret, it's secreting an, ab an abundance, a lot of paracrine soluble factors, and it promotes releasing a lot of quantity of extracellular vesicles, such as protein, uh, liposome, microRNA, and also DNA that have a beneficial effect of immunomodulation against the lung injury. The mesenchymal stem cell also transfer to mitochondria, to the injured lung epithelium and macrophage. Thereby, it can promote the alveolar bioenergetic and enhancing 
the phagocytic activity of the macrophage itself. So the alveol injury is characterized by the impairment of the endothelial and the type one and type two alveolar cells barrier, which is it's disrupt, it's injured, which is results in an intense accumulation of the fluid causing alveolar edema. And mononuclear like such as lymphocyte infiltrates in the interalveolar uh, septums. In mesenchymal stem cells based therapy, the infusion of auto or allogenic mesenchymal stem cells are applied through two primary routes. First is intravenous, and second can be administered intratracheal or intrabronchial. The extravasated or homing uh, the stem cells can trigger a series of direct and indirect repairing mechanism, such as it can reduce the alveolar edema by induce the fluid clearance to the uh, recovering type one and type two uh, epithelial. It decreasing neutrophil functions, which it directly improve the vascular endothelial and alveolar epithelial barrier. Uh, it could enhance the resolution of inflammation further by increasing the release of interleukin 10 that we know is an anti-inflammatory mediators and decreasing the release of the TNF alpha. It also increased the epithelial repair in the type two alveolar cells, which can be restored by the release of angiotensin one. It facilitated the phagocytosis of the bacteria by the intraalveolar and interalveolar macrophage by releasing the antimicrobial peptide from the stem cells itself, extracellularly vesicle to macrophages. The stem cells also can perform the mitochondrial transfer to the injured alveolar cell that increasing their ATP energy content, which can improve the bioenergetic and increase the epithelial of alveolar functions. And it could improving the surfactant release by the type two alveolar cells. And, and the rest is may inhibit IRDs induced fibrotic tissue information. So this is the diagram of possible modes of actions involved in stem cell immunology and cell death modeling functions. The stem cell modulation functions involve the paracrine factor such as interleukin-6, interleukin-10, or extracellular vehicles such as a transporting microRNA, mitochondria, and proteins that were cell to cell uh, contact required. Uh, I'm sorry, not required. By contrast, the stem cells might have a mode of actions involving the connections, the connections, and also can tunneling nanotubes, such as for the transporting mitochondria for a cell to cell contact, which is that's uh, the cell to cell contact required. So this is the transmission electron uh, micrography. This is very beautiful pictures in human uh, microfets and cell to cell interactions with uh, mesenchymal stem cells. On the top left, it is a human macrophage that exposed undergoing a preoptosis, which is in undergoing apoptosis with an intact nucleus and disrupted plasma membranes. And on the bottom left, uh, the apoptosis uh, cells going further, featuring an intact plasma membranes and a formation of membrane uh, bulbs, blebs, sorry, blebs. And on the right side, uh, we can show a uh, human monocyte derived macrophage in close contact with mesenchymal uh, stem cell. The mesenchymal stem cell seems like a large uh, cell here, yeah, with clear cytoplasm, morphologically different from the macrophage. This is the macrophage, the little, the little one. And the orange arrow uh, indicates a tight membrane contact between the stem cells and the macrophage. And the red arrow uh, present uh, the extracellular uh, microvessels. So the stem cells and its secretic factor, such as secretome and microvesicle, can interact directly to the cell at different cellular process, but also have a paracrine activity with a distance uh, effect such as inflammatory modulations, chemoattraction, progenital cells, proliferations, angiogenesis, and remaining all of them essential to correct the cell functions 
uh, within the whole body. So we know that there's a potential mechanism of the mesenchymal, mesenchymal stem cells can directly modulate a variety of immune response from the pro-inflammatory states into the non-inflammatory phenotypes. It suppresses the cytokine storms and also promote uh, the lung uh, generations, especially in, we hopefully in COVID-19 patients. So this is a study using animal subject, uh, give it uh, E. coli pneumonia and show that the group receiving uh, the stem cells have an improvement of oxygenation. The umbilical cord stem cells enhance animal survival, decreasing alveolar protein and pro-inflammatory cytokine concentrations of IL-6 and increasing anti-inflammatory interleukin-10 concentrations and also decreasing the bacterial load and neutrophil. The next is the study uh, from Mathe and colleague who did a previous phase one trial show that one dose escalation trial of 1 million, 5 million and 10 million of MSCs per kilo predicted body weight in patients uh, with moderate or severe IRDS. And his study showed one dose of intravenous stem cells indicated that up to the highest dose could be well tolerated and it was safe in patients with moderate uh, to severe IRDS. The measurement of biomarkers suggested that endothelial injury is significantly reduced. However, the effect was associated with higher viability of the MSCs after towing. We're expecting the, the viability is above 80%. If less than that, so the efficiency of the efficacy, it seems like reduced. So the larger trials are needed to assess efficacy and based on that previous study, this is a randomized phase 2A safety trial study on 60 RDS patients who's conducted and it showed a clinical outcomes did not differ significantly between groups. But the post hoc analysis show a trend for improvement in oxygen index in the stem cell group. post hoc viability of the stem cell emerged as a potential important factor in a clinical effect of the treatment in, in this kind of patients. So, so this result support uh, the finding that a single dose uh, intravenous stem cell therapy is well tolerated, even in a very high dose in moderate to severe IRDS patients. So the next study is uh, with 24 uh, patients who randomized, who receive uh, mechanical ventilation or were on high flow oxygen nasal cannula or the non-invasive ventilation or with the continuous CPAP or bi-level CPAP prior to the initial treatment, uh, the subject, the, those subjects was divided into the stem cell treatment groups who, re, who will receive 100 until 120 million of the stem cell each. Uh, it was infused over uh, 15 minutes on day uh, one and day three. And the subject in the control group received uh, two, infusion, two infusions of the 50 mils of vehicle of cell line at first day and day three. Uh, the result uh, show no difference uh, in infusion associated of adverse effect. And there is no serious adverse effect uh, was observed related to the uh, stem cell infusion between the groups. And the treatment, uh, surprisingly, was associated with significantly improved in the patient's survival. We can see on the bottom up, uh, less uh, systemic advanced reverse uh, free survival and uh, significant uh, longer time uh, I mean, shorter time to recover. So it's uh, recovered better in the group uh, who received uh, the stem cells. And the study also uh, result a significant decrease in the number of circulating inflammatory mediators uh, in the stem cell subject at day six, although there is no difference in viral load between the two groups. So this study concluded that the stem cell infusions in COVID-19 IRDS were safe and could be beneficial in treating subjects with COVID-19 
IRDS. So the next is a randomized double-blind placebo controlled trial who recruited 101 severe COVID-19 patients with already a, a lung damage. They were randomly assigned at a two, uh, two to one ratio to receive either the stem cell around uh, 40 uh, million cells per infusion or placebo within uh, day one, day three, and day six. So the primary endpoint was a proportion of the whole lung lesion volumes from baseline to day 28. And the other outcome that were measured is a six minute walk test, a maximum vital capacity and adverse events that was recorded and analyzed in the study. So the, the result shows that the numerical improvement in a whole lung lesions volume from the baseline to the day, day 28 in the stem cell groups compared to the placebo groups. And the stem cell groups uh, significantly had reduced the proportion of the solid component lesions volume compared to the placebo group. And the six minute walking test show an increased distance in patients who treated with the stem cells. So the recovery level was better in the stem cell receiver patients. The incident of adverse events were similar in between the two groups. So uh, this result suggests that the treatment is safe and potentially effective uh, as an approach uh, for COVID-19 patients who's already has a lung damage. And this is the phase three trial is required to evaluate the effect on reducing mortality and preventing the long-term pulmonary disability. So this is a very nice study showed the umbilical cord stem cell administrations achieve a long-term benefits in the recovery of the lung lesions and symptoms in COVID-19 patients. Uh, the stem cell medications show a numerical improvement in lung lesion volume compared with the placebo. It's decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. We can see in the, in the right uh, box, in the red box. And the stem cell also contribute to the higher proportion of a normal CD scan image, lower incidence of symptoms in the one year follow-up. So this is a very, very nice uh, result. And the study also showed that the stem cell uh, treatment did not affect the productions and the level of neutralizing antibodies of the COVID-19 patients after one year. So it, it won't decline uh, the antibody level, so don't worry. And the incidence of adverse effect is also similar between groups, so it's considered uh, safe. So this study uh, showed a one year follow-up results uh, indicates that the umbilical cord uh, stem cells treatment achieved a long-term benefit in recovery of the lung lesions and also symptoms in COVID-19 patients uh, with a good uh, tolerance and safety limits. So actually this is our own uh, Indonesia study from our four hospital in Jakarta. We included uh, four critically ill COVID patients who randomly allocated into 20 patients received uh, intravenous uh, infusion of uh, uh, one kilogram, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one million per kilogram uh, body weight uh, in 100 uh, mils uh, of saline and 20 patients was randomly allocated into the placebo who's only received uh, 100 mils of uh, saline. So it's a double blind uh, study. And all patients received uh, the standard therapy. And our study can show that the survival rate of the umbilical cord stem cell group was 2.5 uh, times higher than in the control group, which is 10 patients in uh, the stem cell group and the only four patients in the placebo group to survive. And in patients with uh, more than two comorbidities, uh, the umbilical cord stem cells uh, therapy increased the survival rates up to four and a half times compared to the controls. So we're quite happy with the results. So this is our uh, results also show that there is an increase of interleukin 10 uh, on the seventh days after the therapy of the stem cells, although yeah, it's not significant between the difference of the groups. And it's also, there is a decrease of interleukin six in uh, our stem cell groups. And also it shows that the 
vascular endothelial growth factors also increasing in the stem cells uh, group, and the ferritin level was also reduced in our uh, stem cells group. Although all the results, uh, it's not uh, significantly differently. And we never found uh, any adverse effect happen uh, during uh, our study. So the last uh, slides, this is our next uh, project soon. We will use a fresh thought uh, umbilical cord stem cell for COVID patients in the ICU. And this is also a randomized control study. And hopefully we can do it and we will observe the patients uh, from three months to one year's uh, observation. Um, so as the summary, uh, mesenchymal stem cell could be a remarkable adult stem cell source for cell therapy and advantages for responding to a various medical conditions such as RDS or COVID-19 RDS pneumonia. The stem cell therapy for COVID-19 still must be confirmed by refining its efficacy and consistency in therapy, especially in immunomodulation, uh, tissue repair, and uh, long-term clinical outcomes. So we still have a lot of homework uh, in this kind of uh, treatment. So the homework for the best cell source, what is the best doses, what is the best route of administration, and what is the best timing for stem cell therapy, uh, still need uh, further uh, research. Uh, thank you very much. I have no conflict of interest uh, during uh, this presentation. Thank you. That was an outstanding uh, presentation. Thank you. Both how you presented and content-wise, a very exciting topic. And we were really happy that you will share these insights because they might be translated into other settings as well. And I saw that there were already quite some uh, very good uh, questions in the chat. But I think we are going to address these um, questions in the end, um, given that we continue now with the second presentation first, and then we will join again and bring everything together in the end of this fascinating session. Right? And there he is. <laughs> So welcome, Professor Jan Inche. Uh, we are very, very happy much. <laughs> having you with us. And I, I don't know, Krisa, do you want to mention a couple of words or can I already continue? Yes, you can. Excellent. So then I would say we will start immediately with introducing you. Um, as most of you might know, uh, Professor Jan Inche is a professor in clinical physiology and Despite his young age, he has had many leadership positions. Uh, this I can assure you. And since uh, 2020, he had the labor laboratory of translational intensive care medicine of the Erasmus Medical Center Rotterdam, where he does a lot of stuff related uh, to the microcirculation. And if you follow his research, I think we can be uh, short and summarizes as follows that he's very much interested in really making the translation from bench to the bedside to not only use his physiological insight that he has in a lot of treatment opportunities and modalities, but he tries to translate them into clinically relevant concepts and also into new innovations, for instance, to come up with new uh, techniques, technologies um, that are relevant to the critical care society and patient care. And as such, he is also the owner of many uh, patents. Uh, if you have a look at his uh, research, it's clear. He is basically interested in, in any disease that could be linked to the microcirculation, um, oxygen transport, and if we ask him, he would say everything is uh, is important here because the microcirculation plays a key role. You know, I would say this is really a lifelong, lifelong work that he is doing here in this regard, and he is also the inventor of a of many held handheld microscopes uh, that uh, that have been successfully used in in many clinical settings. He is not only a member of many editorial boards, uh, but if you look into his um, research bio, uh, you can see that he has an age factor of 65, which not many uh, have in the world. Th that needs to be really highlighted. And this is based on more than 600 publications and several books that he published. 
I would say your stay, the stage is yours. And if I refer to him, I would always say, for me, it's Professor Microcirculation. So, John, we are looking forward to your presentation, uh, which is called Artificial Intelligence and the Microcirculation. And I can assure you, he is not only able to talk about artificial intelligence, he has also natural intelligence. So now we can get started. Dear Martin, dear Professor Westphal and uh, Professor Chandra, uh, thank you so much. I'm completely vasodilated due to this incredible introduction, and I don't know if I will be able to meet the expectations created by all these very warm words. And what a shame it is that Professor Westphal uh, and myself are not with you, Professor Chandra, at that waterfall behind you. Uh, we would be drinking a beer together, I think, in a tropical shirt like what you have and listening to your rock band. I think that's what we are missing yes, so sir. very, very Hopefully much. next year. Hopefully next year. <laughs> so let us talk to serious stuff. Let me see if I can share my screen now. Yep. Uh, can you see my screen, everybody? Yes. Good. <clears throat> so um, uh, I would like to uh, uh, present to you the latest work that we have done uh, regarding the microcirculation. And as uh, Professor Westphal correctly um, uh, uh, mentioned, um, uh, I uh, work now uh, since uh, two, three years full time in the Erasmus Medical Center. Here you see it. And uh, I am presenting this uh, presentation together with my two very, very dear colleagues, Jonathan Montomoli and Matthias Hilti, and um, who are all, um, uh, yeah, we have been uh, working on this subject and on the subject of the microcirculation for many years. Uh, so Jonathan Montomoli is from uh, Rimini in Italy and uh, Dr. Hilti, is from Zurich at the Universitats Hospital uh, uh, there. Uh, the most important thing that I really have to uh, share with you is that I also uh, run a company um, uh, for uh, 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 two days in the week. It is called Active Medical. A lot of what I'm going to be presenting to you is Active Medical stuff. Uh, it is owned by Active Medical. Uh, we are making now a new device uh, which we will hope to put to market in uh, within two years. And a lot of the software and artificial intelligence we have patents on all are part of Active Medical. And uh, Matthias Hilti is Chief uh, Technical Officer of uh, Active Medical. So that's my main declared interest to you today. Well, as you may or may not know, um, um, we developed in the 1990s the first handheld microscopes which were introduced into uh, clinical uh, medicine uh, and our first areas uh, that we uh, approached uh, were uh, in surgery, uh, specifically brain surgery because it was a, uh, a preparation that was easily um, approachable as you can see here on the top left and we were uh, able to generate a large number of very interesting and new studies looking at brain tumors here, um, in which we've got a glioblastoma, a meningioma, uh, a meningioma and a metastasis, and um, also subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, uh, looking at leukemia before and after chemotherapy. Uh, but in um, uh, these were devices called OPS imaging, followed by SDF imaging, and uh, here we see uh, what the microcirculation looks like underneath the tongue, which is by far the most uh, used um, um, location uh, in patients. And here you can see a, a angiogram uh, and you can see that the underneath the tongue is vascularized from the external carotid artery, uh, which allows us um, a very precise uh, um, um, uh, images of the microcirculation as generated uh, um, uh, more than in the uh, 700 uh, uh, publications on this subject. And what you basically see are dark areas and white areas. And everything that is dark are red blood cells. And so what you're basically looking at are functional um, uh, uh, microcirculation with the red blood cells in it. So if there are no red blood cells in a vessel, you won't see a vessel. 
As I said, uh, the most used uh, uh, location is uh, underneath, uh, 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 underneath the tongue. And um, uh, you can see that this is what we have called the sublingual triangle, which is the best location for um, uh, uh, monitoring the uh, microcirculation. It has been done in very many different scenarios. Here you see it in pediatrics, in newborns, uh, and these uh, is uh, Dan Martin on the top of Everest uh, doing studies at high altitude uh, uh, and under uh, hypoxia. So this is what the microcirculation looks like. Uh, you can see here, this is a SDF imaging, one of the older techniques, and you can see very clearly the single red blood cells uh, uh, going in the capillaries here. And uh, these are veins or venules rather, in which you see they are collecting so you can distinguish venules from arteriolars. And uh, there are two major functional parameters in describing the oxygen carrying capacity of the microcirculation. And here we see it. One is the convection, which is basically the flow of the red blood cells in the vessels. And the other one is the diffusive capacity, which um, uh, is a measure of the ease with which the, the oxygen can leave the capillaries to go to the tissue cells. So if you are a cell here, you have a long distance for the oxygen to travel. But if you're a cell here, it is relatively short. Uh, so that is how you can explain the heterogeneity in oxygen transport to the tissues. So these are the two important uh, parameters uh, functional parameters which could take it. Now this is sepsis and you can immediately see that here we have a problem in diffusion because a lot of the vessels are plugged as you can see here and also in convection because there's no flow going inside the vessels. You can also immediately see the distributive nature of um, the abnormality in sepsis by the uh, very large uh, heterogeneity and the shunting of the microcirculation in these other vessels, uh, which are normally going through. So this type of abnormality, this heterogeneous uh, abnormality, uh, has been shown now in several studies to be the most sensitive, specific um, uh, uh, hemodynamic parameter, uh, which um, can uh, um, um, uh, predict uh, outcome much more so than mean arterial pressure or lactates or SVO2, as shown in one of the several studies, this one by Daniel de Bakker and Professor Vincent. What is also a key issue about uh, the microcirculation is unlike what many people think and what clinical medicine is basically always based on the presumption that the microcirculation is linked to the macrocirculation. So that if you um, uh, manipulate therapeutically the macrocirculation, you will automatically be able to improve um, tissue perfusion and the microcirculation. However, this is not true, certainly not true in conditions of um, uh, of inflammation. And here we can see in this one uh, review paper that you can have very large range of red blood cell velocities at different cardiac output with absolutely no uh, relationship between the two. So in other words, there's a disassociation between the two. And this is very important, of course, because all of clinical medicine is based on the idea of manipulating systemic variables in the expectation that this will uh, be, a, be of benefit to the tissues. So we have uh, called this uh, concept uh, hemodynamic coherence, the idea that under normal physiology, which certainly works, that if you start to increase your blood pressure or your cardiac output, that the tissue perfusion follows. But there are conditions um, in a disease in which this does not occur anymore. We have called them four types. One is heterogeneity, in which the regulation no longer works, like I showed you in the septic condition. There is the hemodilution in which fluids are used and the ability of the microcirculation to regulate itself is lost due to the decrease in the viscosity of the uh, red blood cell and the shear stress. There is then the excessive use of um, vasopressors, increasing either the uh, venous pressures or, uh, and or increasing the resistance to the arterial tone. And finally, there is edema. And each of these four different types of abnormalities allow us to have a differential diagnosis 
of the microcirculation by looking at the uh, abnormalities and thereby uh, choosing a um, appropriate therapy to correct the, um, the microcirculation at the tissue level instead of having to rely on surrogates of hemodynamic uh, variables such as mean arterial pressure and cardiac output. So it's all about the microcirculation really. And it's very diverse in the different organ systems. And uh, here we see the heart, for example, in which you can see a high oxygen consuming organ. And if you look at this, this length here, it's only 10 micrometers. So these capillaries are packed together to increase the diffusive capacity of the heart to be able to extract oxygen to the maximum. So all of these have now, over the many years since we've introduced this and set up some companies to uh, allow it, has uh, resulted in a, uh, um, uh, in a um, uh, uh, community uh, uh, in intensive care specifically, and um, has resulted in this consensus paper from the European Society of uh, Intensive Care uh, uh, Medicine um, uh, um, uh, regarding the use of this particular way of uh, measurement. Um, we have also conducted international trials, and this was the first one we did, such uh, one in 36 ICUs worldwide, on one day measuring all the patients uh, uh, in the ICU, 550 patients, and uh, this we call the so-called microsoap study. And what we basically found there, that if you just take a one-time measurement of the microcirculation, that it really was not sensitive to uh, outcome at all, uh, but rather heart rate, which was um, the single most uh, highest uh, <clears throat> uh, indicator of adverse outcome. But if you combined it with the microcirculation together, you could get a, uh, in excess of 75% sensitivity for adverse outcome in the, uh, critically ill ICU patients. We then uh, did a international database, uh, which we got together to see what variables of the microcirculation are associated to the systemic abnormalities. And this was done uh, in Chile with Glenn Hernandez and Arnaldo Dubin in Argentina. And this is Christian Burma in Leeuwarden. And what we found there really, that abnormal microcirculation, which we knew were, was adversely affected uh, outcome was not associated with cardiac indexes or SVO2, what we want would be expect, but rather very closely related to lactate, but also to the amount of noradrenaline um, being uh, administered to patients. So uh, there were a lot of technical aspects uh, uh, to the performing of these measurements, which made it very, very difficult to um, um, uh, introduce uh, this measurement um, uh, to the clinics, uh, because basically it required um, uh, allow us to, um, uh, uh, to have online microcirculation directed, goal directed, uh, uh, use of this uh, technology. And Matthias Hilti in a, uh, in a Nature uh, Communication um, uh, publication in 2019 introduced um, the automatic uh, um, measurement of the microcirculation uh, called microtools. And this now uh, is um, uh, available by Active Medical, and what we basically do is we invite anybody who has microcirculatory um, uh, images, and we um, uh, analyze these uh, free of charge uh, in uh, um, uh, to uh, in uh, trade for entering them into our international database, about which I will tell you uh, shortly. So you can see here that the. Um, the capillaries are visualized, but we can also extract other new variables such as capillary hematocrit, a discharge hematocrit, and also quantitatively measure the velocity of the, the cells using these so-called space-time diagrams. So um, uh, we um, validated this, and we can now also look at histograms, which also allow us to um, to uh, look at the um, uh, heterogeneity, especially in septic shock uh, 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 of the uh, microcirculation. So um, uh, here we see that we are now able to do a differential diagnosis 
between the different um, uh, uh, conditions of uh, abnormality. Here we see the diffusive capacity and the convective capacity. And you can see here that with low cardiac output, uh, you have a diffusive and a convective uh, uh, association and with sepsis uh, even worse and a septic shock the worst of all. Uh, here we uh, validated this in this, uh, uh, in this paper, which was published in Critical Care Medicine, uh, between handheld or rather hand analyzed uh, microcirculation uh, uh, and the micro tools. And uh, here are the number of microscopic images which were analyzed. And um, as you can see here, these amount of images which were analyzed would take approximately 430 hours to analyze and the uh, software did this in 45 minutes. What's even more uh, important to uh, realize is that if we look at different types of uh, therapies, such as anesthesia or uh, left ventricular assist devices, we see here that the, um, the diffusion and the convective capacity are um, differently affected by different types of uh, therapy, which allow us to have a really well-focused um, choice of therapy for um, uh, improving the uh, abnormalities that we see. So over the uh, last couple of years, we have amassed a large international microcircuitry network. It now consists of more than 750 patients worldwide. And this has allowed us now to uh, uh, look at uh, uh, patterns across the world um, and uh, to look at different disease states and to identify much more sensitively what the abnormalities, which specific parameters are sensitive to disease states and more importantly to therapy. So at the moment now we've got, as I mentioned, uh, 705 patients, actually it's more in um, uh, uh, 23 centers, as you can see here in all the different uh, countries. Uh, and we also have all the clinical variables related to, um, uh, to the disease states. So the way it works is a request is given to us in which we are um, uh, asking us to join the uh, database. Uh, we make a, um, uh, a agreement with the, uh, with the principal investigators, and then we provide in an Excel sheet all the uh, relevant analysis parameters in return. So this allows us now to uh, look at uh, in great detail at the interaction between all the different variables here. We see the variables that we are getting uh, from the clinics, uh, the study ID is here, the study name uh, centers. These are all anonymized. We have no content at all about the identity of the patients uh, other than their uh, age uh, and their sex. And uh, this has allowed us in this large database uh, uh, to look at the uh, variables associated with that. So the microtool analysis, it does a segmentation of the uh, microcirculation, as you can see here, and then produces all of the variables of each vessel in the, um, uh, uh, in the field of view uh, being observed by the microcirculation. So um, uh, we then um, uh, started to... Uh, um, uh, because we've got this large database, uh, we started to um, investigate the possibility of using artificial intelligence and machine tool uh, methodologies to, uh, uh, to analyze the microcirculation. And why is that? Because of course there are a lot of unknown variables that are in these uh, very complicated uh, images, uh, which may be giving us clues as to what is going on at the level of the tissues. So uh, in 2019, we uh, submitted a patent uh, uh, from Active Medical on this particular subject. And in it, uh, we first did a validation of the uh, idea in the response to hypoxia. So, um, uh, so we thought we would first, uh, as a proof of concept, see if we can identify vasodilation. So we had a cohort of, um, of, uh, of volunteers in which we um, administered nitroglycerin uh, sublingually uh, and then uh, had vasodilation. And this way uh, we uh, could test whether then in a uh, external validation set, the uh, AI learning algorithm with neural networks was able to identify um, uh, uh, whether a, a specific um, uh, network had been vasodilated or not. 
And uh, here we see the response of the microcirculation to hypoxia, which is vasodilatation, as we can see here. So the ability to, um, uh, to uh, vasodilate or not is a direct response uh, of the uh, microcirculation to hypoxia. Why is this important? Because we have seen already here in um, uh, high altitude studies that uh, climbers that go to the summit of uh, uh, Everest or other Himalayas, they respond to their microcirculation not by increasing the velocity, but rather by recruiting previously unfilled microcirculation. As you can see here, these are, uh, patient, uh, these are volunteers at sea level. And as they go up, more and more microcirculation uh, are, are present as the uh, microcirculation becomes vasodilated. And why is this important? Because this is exactly what we just recently identified in critical care medicine uh, last year, the response of COVID patients. Because as you know, COVID patients um, uh, are hypoxemic and the uh, uh, microcirculation of the COVID patients respond in an adaptive mechanism to improve the tissue oxygen availability. It does so by two ways. One of them, as you can see here, is a movement of the uh, hematocrit from the systemic, uh, uh, from the systemic in which the um, systemic hematocrit is high and the capillary is low, to the tissues, as you can see here, in which the capillary hematocrit goes up and the systemic uh, uh, hematocrit goes down. And at the same time, it recruits the microcirculation by increasing the functional capillary density of the uh, capillaries. So what is um, uh, artificial uh, networks? Basically, here's a simplified cartoon of what we do. Say that we have a, uh, a number of animals, uh, images of animals, and we want the algorithm to identify uh, whether, there is, whether the image is a crab or not. Well, this then goes into a number of uh, uh, nodes, much like you have in your brain, uh, where you have neurons and connecting synapses and axons connecting, interconnecting all of these. And these are tens of thousands of nodes, not as we can see here. So then we, we go forwards, uh, uh, say uh, 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 it is a, uh, a zebra, um, uh, then uh, um, uh, we know that this is a zebra and uh, we want to identify uh, um, the um, uh, crabs, and this goes back. It adjusts the variables associated, the transfer functions of these nodes and the, um, uh, the connecting axons. And this goes on each time uh, until uh, the training um, a neural network has been able to each time identify a, uh, a crab or not. Then we have got a um, identified um, a neural network system in which we've got uh, a trained neural network. And then we can uh, go into the inference, which is basically being able to identify if we give uh, a crab, then the model weights have now been identified. And then uh, the algorithm can say, yes, this is a crab or not. This is in a simplified version of what uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks does. And why is this uh, possible? Well, um, because of the enormous increase in the, um, uh, in the computing power of computers uh, going much and much higher than previously expected. And because one of these training networks requires hundreds of thousands of different computational um, steps, it has now been possible in the last number of years to develop these AI algorithms. So um, um, uh, uh, we applied this uh, <clears throat> uh, methodology on a, um, a sublingually applied nitroglycerin data set uh, in which we su uh, supplied nitroglycerin to increase vasodilatation. And then we had a training set looking at vasodilated microcirculation in comparison to volunteers. And in that way, we developed an AI algorithm identifying whether the microcirculation, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, vasodilated or not. Uh, so here we uh, gave uh, images to uh, the training uh, network, um, uh, whether it was non-dilated or not. Um, if it was non-dilated, an error came out. 
and it went back into the neural network and this process was repeated until the neural network was trained. Then we uh, provided a different uh, data set, but within the own data set, and we asked them, is this dilated or not? And then the, uh, the algorithm is then able to determine whether it is or not. And uh, this is called the so-called inference. And here you can see it that during the uh, training, uh, the accuracy becomes higher and higher as more and more uh, convolutions are made in the neural network system. And here we can then can see that the validation also becomes higher and higher, reaching areas in between around 80%. So um, uh, that we showed that the AI was uh, possible. And this is my last slide. This is the last study that we did. And uh, what we basically did was we took a large cohort of uh, COVID patients uh, and compared them to volunteers. And we developed an AI algorithm to detect whether uh, patients have got COVID or not. Uh, we did two completely different validation sets, one for the uh, training set um, and uh, then we applied the uh, algorithm-based, the micro-tools, the conventional-based way of looking at parameters to distinguish between um, COVID and non-COVID, as we had done in our critical care medicine. Then we did a, a deep learning uh, uh, or artificial intelligence-based, and then we combined the two and saw if we could get an increased uh, sensitivity. And as you can see here in this receiver operating characteristic curves, and here, the least sensitive one of distinguishes COVID from non-COVID was the algorithmic based, uh, around 75%, still very, very good. The algorithmic, the AI deep learning grade improved it even better. And the combined prediction, combining a physiological uh, parameter with the artificial intelligence gave the highest um, uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, with in excess of 80% in the internal validation. And if we then took a cohort of completely non, which the algorithm had not seen at all, a new volunteer uh, group and a completely new COVID uh, group of the 60 patients, we could see that we could get uh, close to 78% specificity and sensitivity for identifying COVID patients, distinguishing them from volunteer patients. And this has really shown uh, how powerful this technology is, but how important it also is to combine it together with conventional algorithmic-based uh, methodologies to get the best results. So this is our deep learning infrastructure setup, which we have uh, in our company in which we can uh, combine all of these uh, databases. Uh, these are strong, very, uh, hardcore uh, processors because of the high load that the computation uh, requires. And that is uh, my presentation to you uh, today. I uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture and I look forward to any uh, comment uh, uh, that you may have. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Fantastic uh, presentation addressing a lot of topics. So now we can bring the two speakers together and I see all of us in a, in a nice frame here. And I have well, already, well, yeah, I have already <laughs> uh, uh, collected quite some comments uh, from the chat where there is a possibility to ask questions. And I would say, let, let's mix them somehow that uh, we are not talking to one only and then the other one. But I would like to start with you, Dieter. Um, you have nicely shown us that this stem cell therapy seems to be pretty safe. Uh, that was impressing, impressive to see. Uh, you were discussing about the efficacy and in the latest trials, there seems to be really hope being derived from it. And one important question was, do you see any drawbacks here in general? So maybe with regard to safety and efficacy? Yes. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the questions. So actually the drawbacks is, uh, the first is the viability of the stem cells itself. So after uh, towing or after harvesting, uh, it's only uh, uh, in within in good condition within uh, four to six hours after that process to be immediately uh, administered to the patients. Uh, that's the, the, the first drawbacks especially when you uh, face uh, the critical conditions, 
it sometimes is a little bit hard. You you ask from the lab and it has to be uh, told or harvesting and then transfer to the ICU. Um, sometimes it's it's not as simple as possible uh, to, to do that works within four to six hours, if you know what I mean. And because the culture process and is a very resourceful and needs some time, so sometimes it doesn't match with the patient needs and the condition. Sometimes when the, 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 the cell is ready, but the condition is already uh, uh, too bad uh, to receive the stem cells. That's what happened in our RDS or COVID patients in our ICU. And since the process is very resourceful uh, in our hospital, it's still very, very costly. Um, it needs uh, funding from the government. Um, so we really, really depend on it. And some, and some company uh, also give fund uh, to our stem cells uh, center in our hospital. And uh, if we inject that, uh, the stem cell intravenously, sometimes we never know where the, where is the most of the cells are homing into what kind of cells and has the most effect on what kind of organs. Actually, uh, during our study in COVID or RDS patients, we inserted the CVC and we uh, injected uh, the, a lot of amount of stem cell uh, directly into the CVC uh, combined with the low dose of heparin to prevent the block. And we hope, uh, and that kind of administer, uh, administrations can, uh, most of the cell can, can, can home, homing into the pulmonary vascular uh, uh, that, that, that mostly damage in our uh, COVID-19 patients. But uh, some of the centers uh, start to give uh, directly through the uh, bronchoscopy to the, to the bronchial uh, system, but I, I'm not sure that uh, it's, uh, it's a, 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 a the right, uh, I mean, a, a better choice uh, for administration or has a benefit effect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, very good answer. John, I have a, a clinically relevant question to you. Uh, I'm aware that you also had a very good publication with COVID-19 patient in, in critical care medicine. And one question that is always asked is, do the patients die with or from COVID-19? Because as Jean-Louis always refers to, it's a viral sepsis. And what is the causing death or the causing the death? I mean, do you see it really be a dysfunction of the microcirculation of the mitochondria of the endothelium? And I'm particularly asking because of recent observations that obviously also with the Omicron, there is not an immediate, but a delayed death. So there needs to be a hit in those patients that is not leading to an immediate failure of the complete system. But then a couple of weeks or months later, there's excess mortality. And this is not entirely clear. And uh, any thoughts from your side are, are highly appreciated. Wow, what a great question. And um, uh, uh, I don't know really where to start, but... Um, uh, we were drawn into this uh, study because one of the main clinicians, uh, Rick Endemann, uh, phoned us up and said, I don't understand this disease. Everyone's calling it sepsis, but it's not sepsis. And we are doing all sorts of things like uh, playing with PEEP and uh, uh, doing stuff, and we don't know what's going on. We need to understand the pathophysiology. And that's how we got involved in this study. And what is very clear, uh, 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 this is our perception now, we've been looking at uh, COVID now for approximately two years. And I have a feeling as a physiologist that we have a pretty clear understanding about what's going on. So um, uh, what distinguishes, first of all, um, uh, I think uh, using words such as viral sepsis uh, is uh, misleading. Um, uh, because a sepsis is a damage of an organ caused by inflammation, in my point of view, leading to an organ failure. And that is uh, uh, my perception of what we're talking about. And what is different uh, from COVID in relationship to our more normal sepsis is that the insult which we have is um, uh, very directly uh, uh, related to the lung. And um, whereas other sepsis is usually uh, involving other organs more or less simultaneously, whether it be an abdominal sepsis or a urosepsis or, or whatever, even a more classic pneumonia 
is usually multifactorial. Now, what that basically means is that um, uh, you basically are talking about a single organ um, uh, sepsis, very specifically. And what you then see is that the rest of the microcirculation in the rest of the body is still relatively intact. And that's why we can see this adaptation, as it were, to, um, uh, 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 to hypoxia, which is the dysfunctioning physiological variable of the lung causing arterial hypoxemia. And just as if you were uh, going to a large mountain, the microcirculation is able to recruit uh, ourselves. Now, what we found in our critical care medicine paper is that this adaptive response only works up until a SOFA of 10. If you have a SOFA score larger than 10, you don't see this adaptive response anymore. And it more or less is the same uh, as the other um, uh, 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 a type of a sepsis. So we see a lot of leukocytes and you see a, a, a microthrombi a coming by every now and then. There's one other thing that I want to uh, 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 mention in this term. This is the happy hypoxia, as it were, explanation. Another issue uh, regards more a, um, yeah, a critique, if you like, from a physiologist to the mechanical ventilation crowd uh, inside intensivists. So if we look at the, um, the, um, the focus of those people who are interested in um, um, uh, respiratory distress in the ICU, it is almost 100% related to, um, uh, to ventilation, uh, PEEP, high or low, or all of this stuff. Whereas, of course, from a physiological point of view, it is a matching of the perfusion and the ventilation. And there is no um, uh, methodology for looking at the perfusion. And COVID is not a ventilation problem. It's a perfusion problem. So uh, there are a number of issues which have made COVID so challenging. There are no techniques for measuring pulmonary perfusion at the capillary level. And there is uh, the basic idea that if you play around with the mechanical ventilation, you can somehow uh, alter the... Um, uh, the function of the um, of the respiration, and you may uh, remember Martin in Hong Kong in the FCCM um, meeting that we had there about my unproven idea that it was John Marini who said, "I wish there was some way of um, of measuring the perfusion of the lung." Years before we had a disease which was directly targeting this. Why there is a delay? I think in everything in medicine there is delay. And uh, one of the great uh, challenges in medicine is to find out what is causing time-dependent alterations in uh, pathogenesis. Uh, that is something which would require multiple measurements over time. And I think the microcirculation, the methodology provides a good uh, method to do that without invasive or expensive methodologies. A long answer to an excellent question. No, thank you very much. I think that was very insightful, and I'm, I'm sure that this is of uh, interest for um, most of the uh, participants here. So would you say that in short, definitely we need to consider this perfusion abnormalities, maybe in conjunction with coagulation abnormalities that might obstruct the microcirculation and then after a certain threshold is over or is exceeded, no compensation is possible anymore, and then we have organ dysfunction yes. or dysfunction and failure. Yeah? Exactly. And from a therapeutic point of view, I think we should be looking much more at how to effectively nebulize vasoactive compounds mm -hmm. uh, to, um, uh, to these patients. And ones that we have known before, like pentoxifiline, like prostacycline, uh, like Viagra, uh, like all of these uh, compounds and um, uh, in a safe manner and being able to nebulize the whole of the lung, which also is a, a, a big challenge, as you know, as no other, um, uh, to be able to treat respiratory distress in these type of, uh, of patients. But looking at the microcirculation to see whether the microcirculation is sensing hypoxia and is able to adapt to it, I think is a, a useful tool to be able to see whether uh, such uh, therapies are effective. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I think also in this regard, the, the idea Frank van Haren came up with to nebulize heparin, uh, that might also be something if there is Absolutely. Uh, clotting. Yeah. Yep. 
No, thanks a lot. That was uh, very insightful. Then I, I come back to you again, uh, Dieter, and there was some question about uh, where, you, where you would see the best suitable settings for the stem cell therapy. And maybe you can a little bit allude to COVID versus non-COVID settings with regard to ARDS. Do you see any differences or <clears throat> are you able to give already some advice based on the information that is available and that you have access to? Uh, thank you, Martin. So actually, uh, in our hospital, we haven't uh, do the study of the stem cell therapy, especially for the RDS. But uh, we know that the 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 the, the syndrome and the pathological uh, process in RDS, uh, some of them is totally different with uh, COVID pathological uh, disorders, <clears throat> as uh, you all said that RDS is only uh, in the in the lung, but it's some, but it affect it could affect an, an, another on our organs. But in COVID, seems like it's uh, at the same time uh, the lung is affected, but also uh, systemically affected uh, because uh, we know that um, sometimes the oxygenation is still good, uh, but there's another problem with the endothelial problems because of due to the inflammations itself. So. Uh, I think uh, the target of the therapy is, uh, I totally agree uh, with you that the, the target is also uh, to, to, to saving the organs, but we have to focus also on the inflammation process, which is also, it's very, very difficult um, to, to, to measure and um, to measure and uh, to, to, to connect it with the, the therapy. But I believe that if we can control the inflammation from the beginning, uh, uh, some of the patients uh, can be uh, saved uh, more uh, by, 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 that, by, by that, uh, that kind of uh, management. That's why the, the, the steroids uh, study um, can, can give a good result, although we, we still don't know why the steroid uh, can give a good result. Uh, but, but it seems like it's the same like the RDS, but the RDS, it seems like it's the later stage, but the COVID it seems like a more acute or more faster uh, damage uh, that happened. So that's uh, my, my answer, yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> John, I come back to you and I try to combine some questions that, that I have read. Uh, you nicely uh, showed us that there are settings where the microcirculation and macrocirculation are uncoupled. Uh, where is no matching anymore and one question was there in which settings would you then suggest that the microcirculation should be measured maybe if you can consider the anesthesia or surgical part intensive care part and this in conjunction with the question would you recommend doing a baseline measurement maybe before so uh, well wow, that's surgery. a very uh, very broad uh, measurement um i think um um, for each of those um, words that you just mentioned uh, very, very quickly. I see that my battery is going uh, on the break. Sorry about that. Just have to uh, get uh, this um, uh, battery uh, uh, done. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, each one has got a different story. If you look during surgery, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, first of all, generally speaking, if there are conditions of inflammation, um, uh, uh, whether it be fever or um, uh, raised uh, levels of, um, uh, of cytokines, that's when the, um, the microcirculation no longer has the ability to regulate itself. As you know, when you go sporting, your microcirculation goes to your muscles. When you eat, it goes to your stomach. And when you think it goes to your brain, that mechanism gets severely damaged uh, when uh, there is an inflammatory hit. It is also damaged the moment that you start playing around with the viscosity of the blood, such as giving fluids. That particular um, uh, mechanism disappears and you basically get shunting, etc. cetera. So um, um, that's why uh, the whole technology has been so successful in intensive care medicine. It is, I think, when you are giving a, um, a therapy in which you have an expectation of improving a phenotype related to the tissues, 
such as giving a blood transfusion, you expect better tissue oxygenation. Uh, when you are giving fluids, because you think you will improve the convection of the red blood cells in the tissues due to increased cardiac output. Uh, when you give vasopressors, very important, because vasopressors are a very strange therapy to be given, because basically you expect improved tissue perfusion, but you are now going to constrict the vessels to increase the blood pressure. And you see that the patient is not responding in the manner in which you think it should. That's the moment to measure the microcirculation. Because what we see is that the expectation often of a therapy is not met by what is actually happening. And the automatic response of the clinician is then to give more of whatever it is that they were doing. More vasopressors, more fluids. And if it's one thing that we know about all of this stuff is the more fluids, the more vasopressors, um, uh, the more antibiotics that you give, the worse it comes for the patient, and it has nothing to do with the disease. It has to do with the medicine. So I think that's in a, a thing. And I think um, uh, the practical use of the technology, and we've done this in the COVID patients and in several institutes, is to do a um, to ask the nurses, because the nurses are very well able to do this, and just do a, um, a check through your whole ICU to see if there are abnormalities in the microcirculation and then to call the doctor and to say, I think there's something wrong with, uh, uh, with this patient that you're not seeing in the mean arterial pressure. Using that methodology, we've been able to identify a cohort of now uh, 14 patients who've got left ventricular assist devices and who have had tamponade. This was a, uh, a typical thing that the only way that you could really understand that something really bad was happening was by looking underneath the microcirculation and seeing there was a complete stasis. The cardiac output was normal. The patient was uh, uh, completely normal, but you knew that something really bad was going. And it was usually a tamponade due to some uh, clotting uh, 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 in the heart that was then later on uh, evaluated when a very expensive cardiologist came with the echo machine and uh, looked at what was going on. But the nurses were able to just look and say, look, the <laughs> microcirculation is not working. So there are very specific, I think, areas that you can identify in clinical medicine in which such a, uh, a, a technique can be very useful, non-invasive, cheap, and give you very, very precise information. If you have, of course, the automatic analysis to give you a direct feedback about what's going on. Yeah, thank you very much. And I remember I've seen these uh, very interesting pictures that you have shown um, during one conference. And I remember also that we talked about a situation, for instance, esophagectomy. And most of the participating uh, participants might know the story uh, that there might be anastomotic leakages. And we all know if this anastomosis is not holding, there is a serious problem. And Whose fault is it? Of the anesthesiologist, because this is what the surgeons would tell. And, and you, you know, I'm an anesthesiologist as well, and yes, this is uh, not to be taken seriously. But this is arguments I have also heard, and I think that brings it very nicely into context uh, to say whenever it's possible to have pre-measurements, it might be great. And particularly, I think if you have difficult anastomosis to see. Is there a good microcirculation? Because if this is not what is to be expected, but also then to track it maybe, or to have some evidence maybe already on site in the operating room that something might not be perfect, that could also guide therapy. What is your comment I, to that? I just want to react, uh, Martin. I don't know if you are sort of an astro uh, traveling or anything, but yesterday, yesterday, my fellow defended a PH thesis on the use of the microcirculation during abdominal surgery for looking at anastomotic leakage and looking at the microcirculation. I mean, how do you know that? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> how do you know that? I will send you the thesis. And it, it really is a, a very, very interesting to see uh, that. And these are actually looked at um, at, at, at different uh, anastomotic uh, leakages. And I'm going to have a second uh, a thesis also uh, on this particular subject because anesthesiologists and, and surgeons especially, and especially, of course, the, the, the lower anastomosis in the rectum, 
uh, which is of course a, a, a notoriously difficult uh, one. So um, uh, the use of it as a surgical tool also for identifying metastasis. Uh, we have uh, had a, a, a big thesis uh, on its use in liver resections and uh, ischemia reperfusion during surgery, uh, uh, looking at what happens when you resect a liver uh, to the rest of the liver. And we were able to identify that the capsule of the liver turns out to be a pathway for tumors to be able to spread uh, uh, through the body. So each of these uh, areas, um, as you very correctly mentioned, and uh, the, the, the tube reconstructions are of course a nightmare in itself, uh, a complete and total surgical problem. Um, uh, but I think that, that, that what, is, what has been the success of this technique is that it has opened up some uh, castles which have been defended and uh, have given uh, a fresh um, view of, um, uh, of clinical problems that really are, are always there, uh, whether it be fluid resuscitation. But the case for colloids, I think, you know, uh, as you know, one of my favorite uh, subjects, time and time again, we see that the physiological basis for a lot of the therapies are just not there if you just look at blood pressure and cardiac output. That's not going to tell you what's going on. Thank you very much. Dita, I come back to you. There was also interest, if you can already comment whether or not there might be a, a potential for stem cells to prevent or attenuate long COVID. I know that's a very, very interesting uh, question. Maybe not that answer, uh, not that easy to answer, but nevertheless, any thoughts from your side would be highly appreciated. Yes, um, actually, uh, from the nature of the stem cells itself, it's like um, like a potential therapy uh, for, as we know, uh, for a regenerative disease. Yeah, it has a success in uh, neurological problem, uh, hematologic problems, even in behavioral problems. Uh, it starts uh, to be used uh, as a treatment. So in terms of the long COVID, yes, uh, I believe uh, it has potential uh, to improve uh, the conditions uh, as the effect of the long COVID itself, because uh, there are several uh, studies, especially from China, that they observe uh, one year observational uh, start from uh, the lung lesions start to decrease uh, uh, at, uh, during the, the time. and and then they, they also uh, observe the, the exercise uh, time. It's uh, much, much uh, uh, better. And uh, the, the, the patients who, has, uh, who get uh, the stem cell therapy uh, seems like are recovered uh, uh, sooner compared to the patients who, 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 who did not. Uh, they measured uh, like uh, the six minute walking and it started to increase and increase and increase. And, and I think it's, I think the stem cells um, has a potential uh, to improve or prevent uh, the, the long COVID syndrome. Yeah, I believe. But still need a further observational oh, sure. study. Yeah. Sure. I mean, of course, nobody can read the glass ball, but to get some idea and you have yes. extensive knowledge here in that field, uh, that is definitely an interesting opportunity maybe to to address in the near future yes yes that's why we plan to uh, perform another study and observe uh, all the patients uh in in one year uh, uh observational to to see how's the outcome on i mean the long-term uh outcome in our next uh study yeah Thank you very much. John, I will combine again two questions that I have read and they focus on the anesthesia setting. Do you see that there is a risk that under anesthesia, there might also be a microcirculatory shock that might not be identified? Uh, this is one part. And the second part is, uh, would you have any recommendation with regard to the deleterious or unwanted effects of ephedrine versus phenylephrine on the microcirculation? <laughs> well, these are uh, very anesthesiological questions. Um, uh, how shall I say? Uh, uh, we have done some comparative studies uh, looking at different uh, anesthesias and um, certainly from a perfusion point of view, and I must be very uh, precise about that, uh, Cefluran 
causes a much better perfusion of the um, microcirculation than other types of uh, uh, anesthesia. And in fact, we published this in the critical care medicine validation study. Uh, what's interesting is that it, um, it uh, uh, only uh, improves the diffusive capacity. So it, it, it recruits um, uh, uh, capillaries, but it does not have an effect on the flow of the uh, microcirculation. So of course, one thing that you don't know is the heterogeneity between the organs, et cetera. So um, uh, we did a number of studies on uh, epidurals and um, uh, during caesarean section, for example. And uh, there it seems to be much more um, important uh, how the anesthesiology is, is dealing with um, um, uh, is dealing with uh, uh, with fluids uh, than the choice of anesthesia. Uh, so uh, you have enthusiasts for giving a lot of fluids. So you see in uh, conditions such as cardiac surgery, for example, um, and uh, in which uh, the patients go on cardiopulmonary bypass. You see a large uh, increase in leukocytes in the microcirculation, and you also see a decrease in the red blood cell perfusion uh, of this, uh, which is a reason, I think, uh, to consider the use of minimal extracorporeal circulation pumps, uh, which you know our perfusion friends know. There's a large trial going on at the, at the moment called the COMICS trial, and uh, I definitely think that uh, lowering priming volumes in um, extracorporeal circuits should be a prime clinical target uh, when using these devices because hemodilution is really not a good thing for the human body. Regarding uh, your comments about uh, vasopressors, I think it's very, very important to monitor the microcirculation during vasopressors <clears throat> because there is the idea that if you have high uh, blood pressures, that you have an improvement in the tissue perfusion. And of course you might, but if you do that by constricting the vessels, you of course will have high pressures, but no flow in the microcirculation. So that if you give a, a new um, uh, a type of a, a strong vasopressor like epinephrine or, um, uh, uh, or telepressin even more so, and now uh, uh, the recently introduced in the uh, European Union, the new synthetic angiotensin II, um, uh, compounds, which are very strong vasopressors, it might give a certain comfort to the um, anesthesiologist to see higher blood pressures, but the microcirculation will be completely impaired, especially in the kidney. So I think that when uh, giving these strong vasopressors, you definitely should be looking at the microcirculation because what you expect is a low um, convection due to hypotension, which then gets improved as you increase the pressure, but not so much that it goes back down again. And you have the same thing by using nitroglycerin in which you first see an improvement in the convection, but then you get a vasodilation, the blood pressure goes down and the tissue perfusion goes to zero. So it's this yin and yang between perfusion, resistance and tissue flow, which allows you uh, to monitor if you use this technology. Well, I think that's a fair answer and definitely it's also important to see where do you want to increase blood pressure? Is it also a gynecology uh, intervention for a delivery where there might be different targets and as compared to a surgical intervention in a hypotensive patient and also taking into account the individual responses to the vasopressor agent? Uh, that's why measuring it, uh, giving a titrated dose might be a recommendation. And then we come back to what you recommend. Yeah, have measurements, um, get an idea of what you're doing that the patient does not become a black box or remains a black box. Uh, In a black very box. Good, <laughs> very important. Uh, Dita, um, so it's not for free today yeah you get excellent questions from the audience I, i'm really impressed impressed about the quality now there comes a block of other treatments so getting away from lung so what are your thoughts for instance uh, related to osteoarthritis osteoporosis meniscus lesions how do you see here the future of stem cells well, actually, I'm the uh, intensivist and anesthesiologist, and I'm not the orthopedic surgeon, but I've seen 
some the orthopedic surgeon uh, and neurologist uh, perform uh, uh, the stem cell therapy. Uh, uh, on those kind of uh, patients uh, who have this, those kind of problems, um, but usually uh, administer uh, the stem cell directly uh, to the to the injured tissue or to the to the lesions. Um, but interestingly, that's why it inspired uh, me to to do the study in in septic or RDS or COVID patients uh, for giving them uh, stem cell therapy because I've seen. Uh, some of those patients have uh, uh, conditions, I mean, uh, the septic conditions getting better. And I mean, the lung, while, while we perform the bronchoscopy, I mean, the condition of the lung, it's getting better, getting better uh, at the time. So that's that's why I think uh, the stem cell, yeah, beside have a potential on that kind of uh, degenerative uh, uh, treatment, it also had uh, other distant effect in other organs. I think so. I think that's that's my answer. I think, yeah. If if I hear every uh, the two of you talking, maybe we can already summarize. Measure the microcirculation in everybody, and if you still have hope, give stem cells in everybody <laughs> with a problem. But this is something we need to follow up in the near future. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to the organizers. Um, do you still want to comment? Do you have other questions to the audience or shall we already come to an end knowing that there are a couple of questions open, but maybe you can also have a look, uh, a look at the chat. I know Dieter, you answered already some questions there and Jan is not too much left over. So we, I think we have addressed the main and the most important points already now. All right. Thank you, Martin, for uh, moderating the discussion. It is very, very interesting. I've seen a lot of questions for both speakers. Uh, very, very nice topics. It is um, not new, but yeah, certainly it's uh, it's a difficult one. But I've yeah, the discussions was amazing. So thank you, Prof. Shan. Thank you, Dr. Dita, for giving your time. Thank you, for uh, Martin, thank as well. You very much. Yeah, okay. thank you, Martin. Good job. Maybe one last question uh, yeah. with end the comments. So first of all, I would say everybody is saying it's a wonderful country that you're having wonderful people, wonderful Indo anesthesia. <laughs> and the key open question is, will we see each other in person next year? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully everybody is hoping hopefully. that. That's yeah. what we all hoping for. Yeah? Hopefully, yeah. 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 Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. Earlier this morning, yeah. Laura. Don't Laura, give up on hope. Laura exactly. from USA mm -hmm. said that she wanted to go to Kalimutu. Yeah. So we, we told her that hopefully next year we can go to Kalimutu together. Yeah, that would be fantastic. So yeah. thanks again to all of you. That thanks. is outstanding and getting better and better. And I'm really honored and pleased to be part of this great Indo Anesthesia family. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank thank you. Have a good See day. you next time. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.